Do you know what time it is? It's Supernatural story time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only in the dark. Other Spooky Stories, Volume 2, Story Number 1. We moved to a house and everything was really quiet the first six months or so. The neighbors told us that the people who lived there before had moved after their teenage son died in a motorcycle accident. Then, after that, the first six months my dad died. Not in the house after that. But then things did start to happen. I would have friends sleep over. And one night my friend woke me up because she said there was a young guy standing in my bathroom. So I went and checked and nothing was there. Over the next few years, just about any friend that stayed over at night said that they saw a tall, blonde, young guy walking around the house. We did have a few other things happen, like a wine glass that was on the counter and it broke. And let me explain it a little bit better. My mom had a huge collection of glassware, so she had so many there wasn't anywhere to put anymore. So we just set them on the counter. The wine glass had been sitting there a long time. No one touched it and just come out of the dishwasher or anything like that. Basically, she bought it and put it on the counter and never touched it again. When it broke, no one was near it. Only me and my mom were there, and we were both at least 10 feet away. Could it have been something like a crack in the glass? Maybe, but at the time it startled us, and we thought it was weird. And also, getting back to that blonde ghost that was running around our house, well, Another time during the winter, we had the heater on, and my room was always the warmest in the house. However, it was ice cold as you walked across my bedroom to the bathroom that was connected. The creepiest thing that happened was when my boyfriend was sleeping on the couch in the middle of the night, and he said he woke up to a young guy pushing him off onto the floor. He said the guy didn't say anything, but my boyfriend at the time knew that he had to leave, and he did. He wouldn't stay at my place after that. But in truth, can you blame him? Next story. Well, I never had a haunted house, but the street I grew up on was cursed. Everyone on the street built their houses new, so it was a new development. It was all big property, so probably like 10 on the street. Something really bad happened to every house on that street. One suicide, one hit and run, that the person died. One cancer, the person died. One guy fell off a ladder and broke his neck. One kid, less than 18, was declared mentally insane. There were more, but I can't remember the specifics. One bad thing per house. Our house got off light, as in no one died or became paralyzed. Our dad became abusive to my mom and older siblings, and it destroyed our family. My mom and us kids moved away. The next people who moved into our house built a big garage or shed, and then their teenage son hung himself in it about a year later. We found out later that an Aboriginal elder, this is in Australia, found rock markings warning to stay away from the area as there were bad spirits there. Well, I decided I should check if Aboriginals actually believed in evil spirits, and turns out they do. And this pretty much describes exactly what went on in here in southeastern Australia. The thugging mentioned in this story is one of the hundreds of evil spirits whose evil deeds were recorded in stories and songs along the southeast coast of New South Wales. Evil spirits were and are known as Gunges. Generally speaking, contemporary Aboriginal people still believe in these spirits. For example, if they go to a particular area they believe, they must be invited to stay there. If they are not welcome, they will feel this and to remain there under these circumstances will result in being punished. Punishment may mean death or injury, and this may extend to other family members. Some areas are forbidden to women because the male spirits that are believed to live live there will punish them if they disobey the trespassing laws. It always makes me wonder, who were the evil spirits of that place? Next story. A few years ago, I moved into an old one-bedroom apartment in Melbourne, Australia. This was the first time I had moved into my own place, and it was nice not to have crappy stealing roommates. The apartment block, which only had eight units, was built in the 1930s. It was moldy and the rent was interestingly cheap. 
The first few months go by without a hiccup, and I'm enjoying living in this place. I come home from work one day, and I go on to my bathroom. Something caught the corner of my vision. The board, which covers the manhole on the ceiling that has access to the small attic space, is broken in two pieces and on the ground. I remembered standing there for about two minutes trying to make sense of it. I examined the two broken bits of wood. The wooden board is about an inch thick and would have taken Bruce Lee to break it in half. My initial thought is that the landlord may have sent an electrician around without informing me and they had been working in the attic space and broke the board, if that makes sense. But the more I thought about it, the less likely that scenario seemed logical. Anyway, I took a couple of pictures and emailed them to the landlord asking if anyone was in the property that day with an undertone of me being a bit pissed off that she didn't tell me. I received a reply at around 7.30 a.m. the next morning. Her email reads, Please, call me as soon as you are able to. I was worried, thinking, Shit, someone has broken in. I called her, and she explained that her last two tenants said the exact same thing happened to them, amongst other things, and she would send someone around to replace the wooden board. If I wasn't so busy with work, I would have thought more of it. I lay awake at night for the next few weeks thinking what was causing that board to break in half and my first conclusion was that someone was living up there in the tiny little attic space of this apartment which seemed very unlikely. About a month later I woke up suddenly around 4 a.m. which is very unusual. I had had so many goosebumps it felt like someone was rubbing their hands on me. Everything is silent but then I hear this weird sound coming from the roof above my bed. It's this dragging sound, like someone is pulling a sack of potatoes along the floor. I freak out and frozen still with fear. Someone's up there for sure, I think. There's no way a possum would make that sound. After about five minutes of listening to this intermittent dragging sound, I work up enough courage to turn on the light and walk into the bathroom where the manhole is, armed with a cricket bat I keep next to my bed. The new board covering the manhole is broken in two pieces again. I felt sick. I turned on the bathroom light and stared at the black space where the cover on the manhole would be. As tough as I like to think I am, I'm 100% frozen with fear. The dragging sound had stopped. But there's another sound. There's a whispering. I thought my mind was playing tricks on me at first, but the whispering was clear. It was coming from the attic. Please, let me stress at this point that I'm not making any of this up. The whispering sounded like children's voices. It's gibberish mostly, but there's one sentence that I can make out. It's, it's your turn. It's your turn. It keeps repeating. I turned on every single light in the apartment as well as the TV to try and make things feel normal. It's about 5 a.m. and it's still dark outside because it's the middle of winter. I'm watching TV to try and unwind. Then the fuse blows and everything goes silent. My pet budgie in my kitchen, who never makes a sound that night, starts squawking like he's being strangled. I've never heard him make these sorts of noises. He's literally screaming. I grab my car keys and run out of the apartment and go sit in my car. I wait until the sun came up. People are now walking their dogs and starting their day, and this comforts me enough to go back into the apartment. The front door is open, but I didn't think too much of this because I figured I booked it out of there so fast that I didn't close it. Everything seemed normal. I went to the kitchen to check on Dexter, my pet budgie. He's not in his cage. What the hell? I let him out most days to fly around, but there's 100% no way of him getting out unless someone let him out. I start to feel sick again. I look around everywhere but can't see him. All the windows are closed, and the wire mesh screen door at the front door was closed when I came up. I opened the door to the bathroom again. I opened the door to the bathroom, and I can hear a splashing sound. Poor little Dexter was half drowned in the toilet. I take him out, wash, and dry him off. I thought he was going to die because he was breathing in water. I was so confused. The only logical explanation is that someone did this. At about 8 a.m., I called the landlord and gave her a watered-down version of what happened. Oh, wow. You heard the whispering, too, she said. I stayed in that apartment for another 18 months. I only moved three months ago. I heard the whispering again on a few occasions, and twice the manhole cover moved, but wasn't broken. The landlord called me last week. She sounded embarrassed and said that the new tenants, a young Japanese couple, 
had begged to speak with me about some of the stuff that had been going on there. Forget that. It's their problem now. Next story. I was on Manassas' battlefield with my father when I was younger. We were sitting on the back of his tailgate, eating McDonald's on top of a hill looking at some cannons. It was foggy and misty out that day with a slight chill, November I think. All of a sudden we see a man dressed in full Civil War attire waving at us standing by the cannons, about 50 to 100 meters away. My dad had a pair of binoculars with him and we got a closer look at the man. He appeared to be in a Confederate uniform and was standing stationary, only moving his arm to wave. It was like a come over here wave. My dad thought there was a reenactment going on and that the man needed help. So my dad walked down to the man while I watched with the binoculars. When my dad got close to the man, he stopped walking and had a confused posture. After a couple of seconds next to the man, he turned around and sprinted back to me. He proceeded to throw everything in the back of the truck and we left the battlefield in a hurry. My dad said while walking down there, the man slowly disappeared and my dad said he got the strangest feeling in his stomach and mad chills. To this day, my dad gets the chills and goosebumps telling the story. My dad saw combat in Vietnam, so he's not an easy guy to scare. From my perspective, my dad was right next to the guy and never disappeared. We don't know what we saw, but I think it was a ghost. Next story. Cop here. I was dispatched to a house at about 1 a.m. for a prowler. We get there and talk to the residents. Long story short, they saw two people wearing masks, one Jason-style hockey mask, I don't remember the other, in the yard across the street. It was like two weeks past Halloween, so it seemed believable. We checked the area and didn't see anything. It's worth noting the residents didn't seem drunk, high, crazy at all. A few times you'll get a similar call and get there to find the resident is strung out on meth and seeing things. However, back to the story. An hour later, we get called back. This time, we have our dispatcher on the phone with them while we're surrounding the area. It's about five of us in a perfect position. Dispatch tells us they can still see the prowlers in the next yard. We start to move in. Dispatch says the resident saw the two prowlers wave and move into the shed. Guess where I am? That's right, next to the shed. I give verbal commands, bang on the door and say, nothing. Okay, fine, I'll come in after you. Doors open and it's empty. I even think to check for a trap door. Nothing. It's raised about four inches, so there isn't even a possibility of a door leading out. Again, check the area and find nothing. I talked to the residents. They said as I was moving in on the shed, the two put their fingers to their lips, giving the sha sign, and then they both waved. They moved, both moved into the shed as I was next to it. We went over every possibility trying to come up with an explanation. If the caller was just effing with us, they had no prior history of it, as in repeated calls for service at the address. I'm not much of a believer in paranormal stuff, but I can still appreciate a situation where I cannot logically explain what just happened. Next story. We used to live in a house that was built in 1862, a gorgeous big Victorian house with four stories to it. The bottom floor had originally been the kitchen and scullery, but in the 1940s, it had been turned into a separate flat with its own front door. When we moved into the house in the 1980s, it had been returned into one big house, and we used the bottom floor as a playroom, where we kept all our toys and stuff. My mom and dad put a piano in the playroom, and when I was around 14 years old, I started to teach myself to play. No one liked the bottom floor, especially the back scullery, which was a dark room that looked out into the backyard. It was dark and cold and bloody scary. When I played the music, I used to know someone was watching me. I never got this feeling anywhere else. And a lot of times it didn't really bother me as it didn't feel intrusive and I just continued to play. For some reason, I knew it was a man in his 20s and he was sad and also not right, not all there or a bit off kilter. I don't know how to explain this. Sometimes when I played, I got a really bad feeling. I had to leave the piano and scamper up the stairs two at a time. Other times it was fine, but I always knew someone was watching. Well, in my late teens, we spoke to a previous owner who said that the guy that rented the flat in the 40s and 50s was known to have committed suicide. I heard footsteps 
and the stairs creaking, although it was an old house, so it could have just been settling down, at least that's what I told myself. And sometimes we had an intercom at the front door. I heard an odd voice coming from the intercom. Again, I suppose it could have been a malfunction. Those were the days when I would run up the stairs and refuse to play the piano. Anyway, I got quite good at the piano, but never liked that bottom floor. Whatever it was, it's probably still there, scaring the crap out of the new owners. I didn't say anything at the sale of the house. Next story. When I was in my fourth year, I was about 13 or 14 years old. I have no idea what year that is in American schools. I went to a private convent school, and one of the girls there was really nice. And I was invited to her house for an overnight stay. She lived in a big 18th century hall in the northeast of England, miles away from anywhere. She had ponies, and I was really excited at the thought of staying over and riding out. I didn't know at the time her mom and dad were divorcing, and he was also a nasty alcoholic. My friend had an older sister who had been in trouble at school and was generally having a hard time, smoking, fighting, etc. And the house had a real-life poltergeist. No one bloody told me that before I turned up, and I suppose I wouldn't have known what it was then. My mom and granny took me in the car. We drove up to the front of the house and sat there a moment, admiring the place. I always remember this. As we all heard something with big claws scratched down the side of the car. It sounded so weird, but it's honestly what we heard. Everyone was a bit of, oh my God, and looked out the car window. Nothing there. When we got out, I did not want to get out. There were no scratches. I have no idea what it could have been. I asked my mom a while later what she thought, and she weakly answered, Badger? But a badger wouldn't have gone up and scratched the car, surely. There were no dogs outside, and the dogs they had were shut in puppy cages in the kitchen. I have no idea. The house did not have a nice feeling. It was pretty and made of a lovely gray stone with stone hounds on the gatepost. But when you walked in, it felt ominous. As a teenager, I was aware that the atmosphere was very flat, but didn't really think about it at the time. So we had dinner, went to see the horses, etc., and generally mucked about. They had interconnecting doors with little spaces inside. Do you know what I mean? So you would open one door, step up a step, and then straight away open the next door. The space inside wasn't much more than a foot. Well, I opened the first door, went inside, and then couldn't open the door in front of me or the door behind. After a bit of frantically shaking the door and giving it a good kick, it finally flew open and I shot out into the next room. It had never stuck before and everyone crowded around to see what had happened. Later on that day, we were in the garden when someone started throwing pebbles at us. Thinking it was the older sister, we shouted for her to stop, but the pebbles kept going. It never hit us, just plopped around us on the front lawn. It looked as if they were being thrown from an upstairs window, but I couldn't see anyone doing it. And yes, when we went inside to complain, the sister was in the kitchen with her mom and had been there the whole time. I suppose she could have dashed around from the front to the back. The house was jolly cold although all houses were then, and they couldn't keep their goldfish alive. The dogs wouldn't go into the front room, and all in all, it wasn't a very nice place to sleep. My friend said that she used to see phantom dogs on the front lawn, running around and often heard footsteps in the attic. I had a nice weekend, went out for a ride, did a bit of shopping with my friend, and then went home again. In lower six, my friend dropped out of school. She was really bright, and I lost touch. I never went back to the house, but I often wonder whether the strange things were still happening or whether they stopped when the family moved out. Next story. I was a campus security officer that worked night shifts by myself, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. The college campus, like many campuses in the States, used to be a military fort. This one had been around since the revolution starting as a wooden fort, then in the Civil War was a granite block fort. Then by World War I and World War II was an impressive dirt and concrete stronghold with massive artillery batteries and hidden tunnels crisscrossing the campus. It had a bloody past, with people dying from diseases and one guy being shot for mutiny. Many of the old brick buildings were still standing, including the old hospital barracks and officer's house. The hospital and barracks are not classrooms, while the officer's house was converted into a hotel 
where people could pay to stay while students learn hosting, management, and drink mixing. Interesting program, to say the least. Now, on night shift, you're alone. You have to go through all the 200-year-old buildings with nothing but a flashlight, phone, and a set of keys, since the college didn't want security to have mace or anything. If you find a dumbass doing hard drugs, hope you can dial the police in time. There's a story for another day. One night, someone left the lights on at the top floor of the hospital. The hospital is only four stories tall, and there were lights on in other places too, so I just took the stairs. As I closed the stairwell door behind me and made my way up the stairs, I heard a man asking me a question. With the stairwell throwing the voice around, I couldn't make out what he asked. But I know it came from the basement. I went down and couldn't find anyone. No radios, signs of people, or anything. But it was very, very cold, and I felt dizzy. Looking back, I now realize what I was looking around in, why nobody likes going down there. What do hospitals keep in the basement? The morgue? The hotel was definitely the most haunted building. While you could hear voices and get chills in several other buildings, the hotel was one where people would actually see apparitions. And I was lucky, question mark, enough to see one too. That building scared me to this day, and I haven't been there in years. Footsteps, when you were the only one there, mumbling from the basement, dragging sounds, you name it. The worst one I remember is hearing a child laughing when I asked who was there. After making sure I was alone, I got the F out of there. However, as scary as it was, I was and still am fascinated. I would keep going back. Sometimes I would be lucky and have another officer with me for the first couple of hours of my shift. We'd go in, turn off the lights and make sure the doors were locked, then jokingly ask if there was anyone left inside. One night, we got an answer. In the form of a dragging sound on the second floor and the sound of someone screaming, close and distant at the same time. Got the F out of there again. One of my last shifts, I was going through the hotel as two workers were finishing cleaning up. They were both downstairs, one with me, the other in the basement. As I was finishing making sure the doors were locked so that they could just leave and close the doors behind them, I looked up at the second floor banister above the lobby in time to see what looked like a woman in a black skirt, dark stockings, and black heels walking from right to left without any sound and straight into a wall where she melted into the wall and vanished. You guys are the only ones here? Yeah. No guests tonight at all? Nope. Walked around, confirmed nobody else was there. Nope. Done. I'm out. And that's just the hotel and hospital. There are still the stories I have of shadows running across the graveyard. Yes, there's a graveyard on campus. A soldier staring at me from the top of the battlements. Shadows dancing around the machinery in the welding shop and voices calling to me from the darkness in other buildings. But those are stories for another day. Next story. I grew up in a house that was, years after we moved in, found to have a hidden torture chamber behind a false wall in the basement. A lot of unexplained things happened during the 14 years we lived there. One that particularly stands out happened when I was in my last year of elementary school. My youngest brother left with my mom, went to work, and she would drop him off at preschool. My other siblings were all in junior high or high school and left earlier than me, as their school started an hour earlier than mine. My father left before everyone at 5 a.m. every morning for work. I was always the last one to leave on school days. One of my brothers, who was later diagnosed as bipolar, got into drugs the year before, so my parents put a deadbolt on their room to stop him from taking money and things to sell. It was always locked when they left, and this morning was no exception. I left as usual, got about a block and a half away and realized I'd forgotten my math book. I ran back. I'd been gone three, maybe four minutes, but upon opening the door, so much had changed. My parents' bedroom door was wide open, the stereo on. It hadn't been on when I left. The door besides their dresser, which led to a second-story porch, was also open. Nobody in the room, nobody on the porch. Worse, though, was the door to the attic being open. It was never left open. I peered through the doorway, and halfway up the stairs was our dog. She was a teacup poodle, small and very sweet, but right now she was standing shaking on the stairs, her teeth bared, emitting a very low growl. I went up as quietly as I could, keeping an eye on the dark blob of shadows at the top of the stairs. 
I'd just gotten to where I could reach her when it felt like a breeze hit me, carrying a sickly sweet but rotten smell. Then I liked the bottom of a well-used garbage can. There were no open windows in the attic. I reached down to pick up the dog, and when I looked up again, the shadow blob had moved. Scared now, I snatched the dog and ran down the stairs, slamming the door shut. I ran down the other stairs to the first floor, still holding the dog, and out the door. I never told anyone about it. When I went home that day, my parents made no mention of their door being open or the stereo on, so I'm guessing that things were set right before they got there. For the rest of that school year, I went to my friend's house every morning to walk to school with her after my siblings left. Next story. I swear on my life that this story is absolutely true. One of my close friends lived next to a house that was always vacant. It would sell, people would move in, and then one day they'd be gone and the house would be up for sale again. One summer, when the house was listed again and the last family had moved out, we decided to go take a tour and eat some jack-in-the-box we had picked up. We weren't very smart sometimes and thought it would be cool to play chicken with whatever was haunting this house. My friend was really skinny and crawled through the dog door that led straight into the kitchen, then opened the back door for me. Went through all the rooms, and it was pretty nondescript. Just a typical 50s-style bungalow house with a similar layout to his home. Lots of pretty woodwork and built-ins. After we determined that the house really wasn't that creepy after all, we sat down in the dining area. On the floor, across from a little horseshoe-shaped nook, with a kitchen table and built-in bench. It was dusk, but the windows didn't have any curtains and it never got that dark in our city anyway. At this point, we had been in the house for maybe 25 minutes and after we finished eating, we stayed sitting just to hang out and talk since we weren't spooked out at all. All of a sudden, mid-sentence, completely out of nowhere, my vision went black and I felt this eerie coldness wash all over me. A feeling so thick I felt like it penetrated me through my body down to my bones. At the very same moment this happened, my friend screamed. I virtually could not see anything and was groping around trying to find something to grab onto and I felt so unsettled and cold. There's really no other word for it. After what felt like hours, I felt my friend's hands in mine and he pulled me to my feet and dragged me through the house to the back door. He kept pulling on my arm, and I still couldn't see anything. We got outside and slowly, you know, that feeling when you get a whole body shiver and it runs down your spine. As soon as I was outside, that's what I felt. Except this was a whole body shiver that started at the tip of my toes and went all the way up to my scalp. Unexpectedly and suddenly, I could see again. My friend was as pale as a sheet and looked absolutely terrified. I felt off and sort of gross, I guess is the best word, and in shock. I told him that I couldn't see at all until I was outside, that it felt like I had been enveloped in blackness. He was just staring at me and I finally asked him why he had screamed. He hugged me and told me he pulled me out of the house as soon as I started reaching around like I was blind because a little girl who was completely black and yet see-through crawled out from under the table we were across from and sat on top of me. Next story. The house I grew up in was very strange. My friends didn't like to spend the night and said that they had weird dreams there. At night, it often sounded like someone was moving furniture around in the living room. My mom and I would randomly smell cigar smoke when no one in the house smoked. We would catch movements out of the side of our eyes and nothing was there. Our dogs would suddenly be leap up and follow something with their eyes or would start wagging their tails for no apparent reason. I once had a dream about a man wearing a red plaid shirt with black hair and a mustache leaning on the fence in the backyard. It was so striking that it just stuck with me for about a week before I mentioned it to my mom and she had experienced a dream about the man in the past. We think that might explain the cigar smell. I was once home by myself and washing dishes when I heard the wood floor creaking behind me like someone was walking on it. I spun around. No one was there. I went back to washing dishes and there was a few creaks closer. I turned around and asked whatever it was to stop. It did. The most unexplainable thing happened one night when I woke up to a scratching and rustling noise in my room. I thought that someone had broken into the house and was in my room. So I laid still for about ten minutes as the noise continued. 
Then music from the music box on my shelf started playing. I flipped over in bed and no one was there. My bedroom door was closed and my dog was standing at the other side of the room staring at the bookcase where my music box was. I got out of bed and saw that the drawer had been pulled out, hence the slow scraping noise, and that it had finally been pulled out enough to trigger the music. It was on a flat surface so it couldn't have slowly slipped and it was too high for my dog to reach even if he had actually the capability of being able to bother it. My mom said that the people my parents bought the house from was a widowed father with a young daughter. His wife had died from cancer in a home hospice in the house. She said that when I was a baby, she would hear me laughing and babbling when I was alone in my crib. And when she would look in the nursery, I would be looking up at something. For some reason, she felt like it was connected to the woman. Next story. When I was 16, my parents lived in a temporary rented house in another part of Ocala, Florida. It was a pretty open neighborhood in a decent but not great part of town. One day, I was home from school and the doorbell rang. Tall, disheveled looking man, maybe like late 30s, early 40s, was at the door. He said hello and that his car had broken down and he needed to use the telephone. I told him I was sorry, but unfortunately I couldn't help. I just didn't feel comfortable with letting him inside. He shrugged his shoulders and walked down the street. As I watched out the window, the guy got into his car and drove right past the house, looking in my general direction. He couldn't see me behind the blinds. But the fact that his car was fine sent shivers down my spine. What would have happened had he gotten in? What had he planned? Next story. When I was 10 years old, it was the day before Mother's Day, and my dad had taken my older sister and I to the mall to get her a present. This was like a week night, though, so the mall was pretty dead aside from a bunch of mall rats, as that's what my dad called them. They were just really either old people that sat on the benches and stared at people or gothic teenagers who all have the pierced things and mohawk stuff going on. Anyway, the shopping was done and I had to go to the bathroom. My dad and sister waited on a bench and I walked through these double doors that opened up to a long corridor and led to the bathroom all the way at the end. I walked down and peeked inside the bathroom. There were only two stalls, but for some reason the main door was propped open. I went in anyways because I really had to pee. So there I am sitting on the toilet doing my business when I hear voices coming down the corridor. They sounded like a group of teenage goth mall rats. I stood up, flushed the toilet, and I'm about to open the door when I hear one of them come into the bathroom. I froze because I thought it was weird for a guy coming into a girl's bathroom. There was a moment of complete silence, and then I see a pair of black heavy boots approach my door. Then without hesitation, this guy just starts shaking the door really hard and violently, all while making some sort of weird animal-like noise. I sat back down on the toilet and almost started crying because I had no idea what was going on. The guy looked in the crack at the door, and I could see that he had one of those huge septum rings on, and it freaked me out even more. I heard the other guys that are standing in the corridor outside of the bathroom say, Just grab her leg from underneath. So this guy starts kick sticking his hands underneath trying to grab me. But I pulled my legs up the toilet and started hitting his hands with my little purse. Then he goes into the next stall and tries the same thing. The entire time he's like grunting and making weird sounds. I was so freaked out. I also couldn't speak for some reason. I was like frozen and my mouth couldn't form any words. Then I heard one of them say something about a cop car parked out front, so they all left through a side exit. I sat on the toilet paralyzed with fear. I squeezed my eyes shut for about five minutes trying to convince myself that it didn't happen. But when I opened my eyes again, I could see the boot prints on the tiles of the floor, and it made me more scared. Finally, my sister came in asking me why I was taking so long, and I burst out of the stall, crying my head off and booking it down the corridor and back to my dad.